through sadhus wandering about and teaching the people metaphysics it is all madness our guru deva used to say an empty stomach is no good for religion poor people are leading a life of brutes due to ignorance and seeking various ways to better the condition of all down to the chandala through oral teachings and by means of maps cameras globes and such accessories can that bring forth good in time if a mountain does not come to muhammad muhammad must go to the mountain we as a nation have lost our individuality we have to give back to the nation its lost individuality and raise the masses to effect these first we need men I am the first monk to come over to these western countries. It is the first time in the history of the world that a Hindu monk has crossed the ocean. It is the weak heart that has driven me out of India to seek some help for those I love. On the morning of the opening of the parliament We all assembled in a building called the Art Palace. There was a grand procession and we were all marshaled to the platform. Imagine a hall below and a huge gallery above, packed with 6 or 7000 men and women representing the best culture of the country. And on the platform, learned men of all the nations of the earth. And I who never spoke in public in my life to address this august assembly sisters and brothers of america a deafening applause of 2 minutes followed it fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of the monks in the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of all religions. And I thank you in the name of millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. I will quote to you my brethren few lines from a hymn which i remember to have repeated from my earliest childhood which is every day repeated by millions of human beings as different streams having their sources in different places all mingle their water in the sea so oh lord the different paths which men take through different tendencies various though they appear crooked or straight all lead to thee <laughs> was finished i sat down almost exhausted with emotion i 
am now out of want. Many of the handsomest houses in this city are open to me. I can, if I will, live here all my life in the greatest luxury. But I am a sannyasi. And India, with all thy faults, I love thee. talk a lot about myself because I owe that to you. I was born in Bengal. My father and mother fasted for years and years so that I would be born. I know that it was consciously that my mother brought me into the world to be what I am. The love which my mother gave me has made me what I am. And I owe a debt to her that I can never repay. I studied hard for 12 years and became a graduate of Calcutta University. At the beginning of this 19th century, it was feared that religion was at an end. Under the tremendous sledgehammer blows of scientific research, old superstitions were crumbling away like masses of porcelain. Those to whom religion meant only a bundle of creeds and meaningless ceremonial were in despair. This skepticism reached me. And for a time, I felt as if I must give up all hopes of religion. In the city of Calcutta, I wandered from place to place in search of religion. And everywhere I asked the lecturer after hearing a very big lecture. Sir, have you seen God? The man was taken aback at the idea of seeing God. And the only man who said, I have, was Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. And not only so, but he said, I will put you in the way of seeing him too. This man came to live near Calcutta, the capital of India, the most important university town in our country, which was sending out skeptics and agnostics by the hundreds every year. This old man was peculiar. He didn't go much after intellectual scholarship, scarcely studied books. But when he was a boy, he was seized with this tremendous idea of getting truth direct. He first started by studying his own religion. And then he got the idea that he must get the truth of other religions. And with that idea, he joined all the sects, one after another. He would eat and dress like the people he wanted to understand, take their initiation, and use their language. One must learn, he said, to put oneself in another man's soul. And this was his home. No one ever before in India had become Christian and Mohammedan and a Vaishnava by turn. And when he had gone through with all that, he came to the conclusion that they were all good. They're all in so many ways leading to the same goal. Long before the idea of universal religion and brotherly feelings between sects were discussed and mooted in any country in the world, here had been a living man whose whole life was a parliament of religion. Many of these university men, skeptics, agnostics, used to come and listen to him. I went to hear him. For the first time, I had seen a man who did say that he saw God and that religion was a reality to be felt. <laughs> All skepticism was brushed aside. I began to go to that man day after day and I actually saw that religion could be given. My master used to say, 
religion can be taken and given more tangibly, more than anything else in the world. Master. My master. At first, I did not accept most of what the master said. Once I said to him, The forms of God and things like that which you see in your vision are all fragments of your imagination. I did not believe in anything. One day he said to me, Some people call me God. Let a thousand people call you God, but I shall certainly not call you God as long as I don't know it to be true. Then why do you come here? I come here to see you, not to listen to you. He was very much pleased. Ramakrishna came to teach the religion of today. Constructive, not destructive. He had to go afresh to nature to ask for facts. And he got scientific religion, which never said believe, but see. And they were not peculiar to him. Nor did he claim that they were. But, but I don't find a marvelous miracle than the way this mad Brahmin used to handle human minds like lumps of clay, breaking, molding, and remolding them at ease, and filling them with ideas by a mere touch. I cannot think or talk of Sri Ramakrishna without being overwhelmed. How shall I speak of him? came the sad day when our old master died. I went there when I was about 16. Some of the other boys were still younger, some a little older. When my master left his body, we were, we were a dozen penniless boys and unknown boys. But together, we conceived that this ideal had to be spread. We shall begin a universal religion here and now. We will not wait. We will show the spirituality of the Hindus, the mercifulness of the Buddhists, the activities of the Christians, and the brotherhood of Muhammadans by our practical lives. That made me go from the Himalayas to the Cape Cameroon, from Indus to Brahmaputra. Many a times I have been in the jaws of death, starving, footsore and weary. For days I had no food and could walk no further. It was true. I often used to sleep under the banyan tree with a bowl of rice given to me by a kindly peasant. But it is equally true that I was also a guest in the palace of a great Maharaja and a slave girl was appointed to wave a peacock feather fan over me all night long. <laughs> in the course of my wandering, I was in a certain place when people came to me in crowds and asked for instructions. Though it seemed almost impossible, people made me talk for three days and nights without giving me a moment of rest. You should be ashamed of yourself. The youth of India should write the history of their own country. The British have interpreted the history of our country according to their conveniences. What India wants is somebody who can portray her in proper light. They did not even ask me whether I had eaten. Why do you eat Rajas and Maharajas? Because I can't go from door to door. If I come to you, tell you and convince you about my ideas, it will automatically reach the masses. Swamiji, you are a very sincere sadhu. Thank you. May God bless you. On the third night, when all visitors had left, a low-caste poor man came up to me and said, Swami Ji, we have seen that you have not eaten anything for three days. You have not eaten water. Do you have anything for eating for eating? Hearing this, the man shrank in fear. He was a subject of the Maharaja of Khetri and was afraid that if the latter came to hear that he, a cobbler, had given food to a sannyasi, he would be severely dealt with and possibly banished from the state.
but out of kindness of his heart. Even though he feared the consequences, he brought me the cooked food. I shed tears of love and gratitude and thought thousands of such large-hearted men live in lowly huts and we despise them as low caste and untouchables. My plan is to reach these masses of India. I traveled in search of funds in India. But do you think people in India were going to spend money? Rani? Rani, do Indian mothers really throw their babies to the crocodile? Yes, ma'am. They threw me in. But like your fabled Yona, I got out again. How many of you have read the sacred books of the Hindus and therefore have the first hand knowledge of the religion? Please raise your hands. And yet, you dare to judge us? I am a rather plain spoken man, but I mean well. I want to tell you the truth. I'm not here to flatter you. That is not my business. If I wanted to do that, I would have opened a fashionable church in Fifth Avenue, New York. You are my children. I want to show you the way out of self to God by pointing out to you your errors, your defects, and your vanities. Everything that has selfishness as its basis, competition for its right hand, and enjoyment as its goal must die sooner or later. Three more lectures and my London work are finished for this season. Dear Lord says, start for old I was asked by an English friend on the eve of my departure, Swami, how do you like now your motherland after four years experience of the glorious, luxurious and powerful West? I said to him, India I loved before I came away. Now the very dust of India has become holy to me. Bold has been my message to the people of the West. Bolder is my message to my beloved countrymen. We all hear so much about the degradation of India. There was a time when I also believed in it. But today, standing on the vantage ground of experience, I confess in all humility that I was wrong. For the last thousand years or more, you are told that you are weak, you're nobody, you're good for nothing, and you have come to believe yourself such. When a man has begun to hate himself, the last blow has come. When a man has begun to be ashamed of his ancestors, the end has come. Here am I. One of the least of the Hindu race, yet proud of my race, proud of my ancestors. I'm proud to call myself a Hindu. I'm proud that I'm one of your unworthy servants. I'm proud that I'm a countryman of yours, you, the descendants of the sages, of the most glorious rishis the world ever saw. Therefore, have faith in yourselves. Well, if I have a mind, I can sit up in Samadhi in a Himalayan cave. 
Why then don't I do so? And why am I here? Only the sight of the country is misery. And the thought of its future do not let me remain quiet anymore. Feel, therefore, my would-be reformers, my would-be patriots. Do you feel? Do you feel that millions and millions of the descendants of the gods and of sages have become next-door neighbors to brutes? Do you feel that millions are starving today and millions have been starving for ages? Does it make you restless? Does it make you sleepless? Has it gone into your blood, coursing through your veins, becoming consonant with your heartbeats? Has it made you almost mad? Are you seized with that one idea of the misery of ruin? And have you forgotten all about your name, fame, your wives, your children, your property, and even your own bodies. Have you done that? That is the first step to become a patriot. The very first step, my plan for India, as it has been developed and centralized, is this. To reach the masses of India, I believe in God and I believe in man. I believe in helping the miserables. May I be born again and again and suffer thousands of miseries so that I may worship the only God that exists, the only God I believe in, my God, the wicked, my God, the miserable, my God, the poor of all races, of all my whole ambition in life is to set in motion a machinery which will bring noble ideas to the doors of everybody. Women must be given education and left for themselves. After that, they will act as they think best. They will tell what reforms are necessary for them. Revive the old arts. Give them artistic cooking and sewing. Let them learn painting, photography, the cutting of designs in paper, gold, silver, filigree and embroidery. See that everyone knows something by which she can earn a living in case of need. Hmm? I do not believe in God or religion which cannot wipe the widow's tears and bring a piece of bread to the orphan's mouth. Travelling through many cities of Europe and observing in them the comforts, the education of even the poor people. There was brought to my mind the state of our own people. What made the difference? Huh? Education was the answer I got. There must be centers to educate monks in the method of education. Swamiji, yes? this task is too difficult. To establish harmony and cooperation among people of various castes and sects that are current in this country and to make them act in unison for a common purpose. Do not come here anymore if you think any task too difficult. By the grace of the Lord, everything becomes easy of achievement. Your duty is to serve the poor and the distressed without distinction of caste and creed. What business have you to think of the fruits of your action? Your duty is to go on working. Everything else will follow of itself. My method of work is to construct and not to destroy that which is already existing. We are all intelligent boys. And you profess to be my disciples. Tell me. Tell me what you have done. Can't you give away this one life for the sake of others? Sri Ramakrishna said to me, 
Wherever you take me on your shoulders and place me, there I will go and stay. It is therefore that I am myself carrying him on my shoulders to the new mud grounds. Know it for certain that Sri Ramakrishna will keep his feet fixed for the welfare of many for a long, long time. Uh, oh, I can hardly sit up or write, but still feel duty bound to write this letter. <laughs> Fearing lest it becomes my last one. Know for certain that the work done by me is not the work of Vivekananda. It is his work. If one governor general retires, another is sure to be sent in his place by the other. like a disused garment but I shall not cease to work I shall inspire men everywhere so there will be no lack of Vivekanandas if the world needs them thousands and millions of Vivekanandas will appear Thank you. 